This may not be professional, but I am really thankful to be here this morning. I would never dream when I first got saved 16 years ago that God would ever put me behind the pulpit of Landmark Baptist Temple. And I humbly come this morning that I stand in the, one of the greatest pulpits in our country. And I'm so thankful that I have the privilege of being here. It, it was a great honor to be on a Wednesday night to stand here and preach on a Wednesday night but to come on a Sunday morning and preach, I guess the cream of the crop, icing on the cake, and it being my anniversary, God just really gave me such a wonderful prize is to be here this morning, and uh, I'm so thankful that I can stand and preach about Jesus Christ. Uh, I don't know about you folks, but I'm glad I'm saved. I may not be a whole lot, if you look at me, I'm a whole lot. But uh, now you keep in the choir now. You, don't, you keep it down, especially you, Brother Brock. Uh, uh, but Lord sees me and says, he's my son. He's my child. And I'm glad that he knows me and I know him. Now this morning, I want you to turn in your Bibles to Luke. I want you to turn to chapter 23. I want to bring a message titled Barabbas. Barabbas. In Luke chapter 23, we'll read, start reading in verse number 13 through 25. Now, I would like to encourage each and every one of you to listen and listen very carefully. Boys and girls, I know that you're here with us adults, and, and this time seems to drag by for you, but I want you to listen to me very carefully about this man, Barabbas. I want you to listen to me very carefully about Jesus and Barabbas, the difference between the two, and what Jesus did for Barabbas. I think you'll find that Barabbas will represent all mankind. I think you'll find that Barabbas knew five things that I want you to know that Barabbas knew. And I think if you know these five things and you accept these five things, you can receive Christ as your personal Savior. And believe me, if you're here this morning or listen to me by or watching me by TV and you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you don't know what you're missing. I've been on both sides of the track. I used to take drugs to get high, and I used to be an alcoholic to be high, and, and try to gain life and get a hold of myself and get all the gusto of life through those things, but you know, they, they only last for a season, and that's no way to go. They destroy your life, your mind, and send your soul to hell. But when I met Jesus Christ, I've been on a high ever since. Oh, I haven't been going around smiling ever since or, or living in a bed of roses because there's thorns in those roses, but I have a better life with Jesus Christ than I do without him. I've been on both sides of the fence, boys and girls. And ladies and gentlemen, I've been on both sides of the fence, and this side of the fence with Jesus Christ is a whole lot better than without him. Amen? Now, I want you to listen to me. I want you to read with me. In verse 13, And Pilate, when he had called together the chief priests and the rulers of the people, said unto them, Ye have brought this man unto me as one that perverteth the people, and behold, I have examined him before you, have found no fault in this man, touching those things whereof ye accuse him. No, nor yet Herod, for I sent you to him, and lo, nothing worthy of death is done unto him. I will therefore chastise him and release him, for of a necessity he must release one unto them at the feast. And they cried out all at once, saying, Away with this man, and release unto us Barabbas, who for a certain sedition made in the city and for murder was cast into prison, and Barabbas did that. 
He committed murder. He stole things that did not belong to him. In the process, murdered a person. Verse 20. Pilate therefore, willing to release Jesus, spake again unto them. But they cried, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. And he said unto them the third time, Why? What evil hath he done? I found, have found no cause of death in him. I will therefore chastise him and let him go. And they were instant with loud voices, requiring that he might be crucified. And the voices of them and of the chief priests prevailed. And Pilate gave sentence that it should be as they required. And he released unto them him that for sedition and murder was cast into prison, whom they had desired, but he delivered Jesus to their will. Let's go to God in prayer, please. Our Heavenly Father, we yield ourselves to thee. We ask that your Holy Spirit will come and every heart and every ear will be lent to this message, especially those that are lost, that they understand what you did for them and that they understand what Barabbas knew they should know. I pray, Father, that your will be done and so will be saved this morning, if there be any here. I pray that Christians will be lifted up this morning by this message, that they be excited what you have done for them, and that our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Now, Lord Jesus, you get glorified this morning, and you be lifted up. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I want you to listen to me very carefully. I want to bring you something that I believe each and every one of us should know. And there's five things that Barabbas knew. Number one, he knew he was guilty under the law of God that he had broken. Barabbas knew without a shadow of a doubt that he was guilty of breaking God's law. God's law was that he shall not kill, but Barabbas killed a man. And thou shalt not steal, but Barabbas broke that law and stole. And while he was stealing in the process, he killed a person. And so Barabbas knew without a shadow of a doubt, ladies and gentlemen, this morning, that he knew that he had broken God's law. You and I need to understand that before we can go on any further about salvation. You must understand that you are a sinner without Christ. And you have broken the law of God. Now we says in the Bible, for all have come short of the glory of God. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's what the Bible says. But listen to me. There's a lot of us here this morning. I believe all of you are good people. If we start measuring ourselves with one another, we, we can say, well, this person's a good person. Well, that person is a good person. My mother is a good person. That teenager is a good person. But we're not to compare ourselves with one another to the, to the place where we misjudge our sins before God Almighty. You see, folks, we sin against God, and we must answer to God. We can say we're good people, but my friend, that is not enough to get yourself into heaven. You must understand you broke God's law, and Barabbas knew he broke God's law, and all men must understand that they have broken God's law. Thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not kill. Barabbas did it all. He represents all mankind this morning. He represents all mankind. For the Bible says, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. I've seen people say, well, I've done pretty good. I've done pretty good. I've never sinned. I've never committed adultery. I've never stole anything. I've never killed anybody. But you know, ladies and gentlemen, the Bible says, and the Bible is true, amen, that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I said come short of God's glory. You miss the mark whenever you stand before God. And that's the person that you're going to stand before one of these days. There's only one way that you can stand righteous before God Almighty, and that is through the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Through the righteousness of Jesus Christ will men or woman or boy or girl stand. If you're going to stand before God and dwell eternity in heaven, you must come through Jesus Christ. But you first must understand that you have broken God's law. And the law demands death. And that's why Jesus Christ died. For all mankind, 
so that all mankind through Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection can be saved. Isn't that wonderful, ladies and gentlemen, that we can be saved through Jesus Christ? Now, Barabbas knew that he was guilty under uh, the law of God that he had broken. Do you know that you're guilty? That's what you've got to know. And another thing Barabbas knew, he knew that Jesus did no sin. Jesus stood before the congregation of those scribes and Pharisees and Sadducees, and he looked them right in the eye and he said, Which of you convicts me of sin? In other words, which of you can say that I have sinned? Point out my sin. Yeah. Tell me just one sin that I have done. Which of you can convince me of sin? Which of you can convict me of sin? Which of you can find guilt in me of my sins? Not a one can answer to that. No one can answer to that. No one can stand and say, well, I knew Jesus Christ sinned this matter and that matter. No, sir. Jesus Christ knew no sin until he got on the cross and took all mankind's sin upon him. Barabbas knew he had done no sin. Jesus had done no sin. But Barabbas knew that he had broken the law. Barabbas broken the law. Jesus never broke no law. He come to fulfill the laws of God Almighty. Jesus always did that which, which was pleasing in the sight of God. And he always did what God commanded him to do. Even to the cross. Even when he says, Father, not my will be done, but thy will be done. He always did the things that pleased God. He never did no sin. Barabbas knew this man Jesus. This man Jesus went about the country and did nothing but good. Fed the thousands, raised the dead, healed the blind, the crippled would made able to make walk, and all these things. He knew everybody in, in Israel's time, in that time in Palestine, knew about Jesus Christ, that he was a good man. Even Pilate himself stood up and says, I find no fault in this man. Barabbas knew that Jesus did no sin. Pilate knew, the governor at that time, knew that Jesus did no sin. King Herod stood and said, I know no, this man has done no fault, and I find no uh, reason for him to be put to death. So there's something you need to know, is that ye, you are guilty under the law of God that you have broken, and that Jesus had done no sin. And the third thing Barabbas knew, he knew that Jesus was for him a true substitute. Did you catch that? He knew that Jesus was for him a true substitute. Did you catch it? Barabbas knew without a shadow of a doubt that it was Jesus dying in his stead. He may not have understood the Trinity. He may not have understood the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. He may not have understood the deity of Jesus Christ and all what Jesus Christ did. But one thing Barabbas did know was that Jesus was taking his place. Barabbas was told that that middle cross would be yours, Barabbas. That middle socket where they dropped down that cross, down in that hole, that would be yours. And that cross that we're making is for yours. See, Barabbas was not in prison waiting to be sentenced. He was not in prison waiting for a trial. He already had been tried, tried and he had already been condemned to death. He was waiting on a day, to, the next day to die, but Jesus took his place and Barabbas knew that. Do you know that? Jesus was dying in Barabbas' place. Jesus was taking the penalty of the law on which Barabbas had broken. He's taking it upon him. And ladies and gentlemen, Jesus Christ took the sin upon him that we're all committed. Right. You know something, ladies and gentlemen? You don't die and go to hell because of your sins. If you go to hell, you'll go to hell by rejecting Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ already died for our sins. Yeah, right. Your sins may keep you from coming to Jesus Christ, but the sin that will send your soul to hell, and my friend, you will die and go to hell without Jesus Christ. Yeah. And I say that very humbly. 
I say that with a broken heart, and I don't want any one of you to die and go to the devil's hell. I do not stand up here and boastfully that I know that there is a hell. I stand here humbly before you, realizing there is a hell, so we must preach Jesus Christ that will keep you from going to that horrible place. Jesus Christ was a true substitute for Barabbas, and he's your substitute this morning. Jesus Christ took the penalty of the law upon him, the penalty of the law that all mankind has broken. We must all die. For the Bible says the wages of sin is death, ladies and gentlemen. The wages of sin is death, not just physically, but spiritually you're going to die. That is, separate yourself from God and be cast into the lake of fire for eternity, for eternity, for eternity. And there's no stopping off. There's no place you pay for a little while and then you go on to be in heaven. No, sir. No, sir. When you die in your sins without Jesus Christ, you're condemned to hell for the rest of eternity. You say, I don't believe in that stuff, preacher. I don't believe in hell. I had a preacher, a friend of mine, well, not a preacher, a friend of mine, a preacher acquaintance of mine, said we don't preach hell because we don't really want to offend people and we're really not convinced there is a hell. And I told him, won't you get out of the ministry? Amen. Won't you quit play, playing religion and get out of the ministry and earn an honest living? Right. My friend, the Bible says they're a hell. Jesus Christ speaks of hell more than he speaks of hell to heaven, and he wants people to go to heaven and stay out of hell so much that he died for you, died for all mankind. And as I was sitting there, I, I just contemplated back 16 years ago as I uh, came to know Jesus Christ and how rotten, how vile, how mean I was. And why would Jesus die for somebody like me? You ever think about that, boys and girls? Why would Jesus die for somebody like you? Why would he die for such people as us? Sometimes we get into religious services and we get into church for several years, we begin to think we're pretty good. And we forget where we come from. You ever, you ever came across people who forgot who, who they were and where they come from? They act like they're high and mighty and snotty old people. That kind of makes you sick to be around them. But ladies and gentlemen, I've been around religious people that thought they was high and mighty and they was all clean and righteous and done no sin and they were really a blessing to God. Let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen, each and every one of us that if we are bought by the blood of Jesus Christ, we are still yet in our sins. We're still sinners. We still have to contend with our flesh and thank being to Jesus Christ, though... Our sins have been forgiven. We need to remember who we are. We are sinners. We need to remember that Jesus Christ paid the sin debt. Jesus Christ was the substitute. Instead of me dying and going to hell, Jesus Christ died in my stead, and Barabbas knew that. 1 Peter 2.24 says, Who his own self bear our sins, in his own body on the tree. Jesus Christ bore our sins on him. Amen? Amen. I don't understand it. I really don't understand why God would love the world like you and I. I really don't understand it, but he does. Amen? Amen? Barabbas knew that he was guilty under the law of God that he had broken. He was guilt. He knew that Jesus did no sin. He knew that Jesus was for him a true substitute. And the fourth thing, he knew he had done nothing for the substitutional death. There's one thing Barabbas knows, and I believe each and every one of us should know this morning, that Barabbas done nothing for the substitutional death, and I did nothing, and you did nothing for Jesus to die for us. Barabbas was in prison. Perhaps he never spoke to Jesus in a conversation. He never did anything for salvation. He never did anything in a favor to God or Christ or anybody else to get off of that cross out of the death penalty. Jesus Christ gladly did it. 
He took the, his place, and Barabbas didn't do anything. Romans 5, 8 says that God commended his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Christ died for us. When I was a drunkard, Christ died for us. He died for me. Whenever I was drunk and I lift my voice up to God and cuss God and say, you're nothing, everybody thinks you're something, but I don't believe you're something, I think you're nothing. Every time I did what I did, of drugs and alcohol, and, and with my family, with my dear wife, the evilness that I've done, and most of you know all the things I've done, some of them. I'm ashamed of that, but Jesus Christ still loved me. He still died for me. Why? John 3, 16. Any of these little boys and girls can stand and testify to that and, and, and lift up their voice and say, For God so loved the world. That's it. For God so loved the world. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Amen. He loves you and me. He loved Charles Manson. He still loves that man. He loved, he loved, he loved uh, 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 Hitler. He still loved that man. Even though Hitler turned against the Jews and destroyed several million Jews by his orders, God died for him. Amen? He died for all mankind, no matter what you've done. I came across Christians that said, well, we, that person there don't deserve to be saved. My friend, you don't deserve to be saved either. None of us deserves to be saved, but God loved the world, that God so loved the world that he gave his, his only begotten son. Now that's something, isn't it, ladies and gentlemen? Barabbas knew that he was guilty under the law. Do you know that? Barabbas knew that Jesus did no sin. Do you know that? Barabbas knew that Jesus was for him a true, true substitute. Do you know that? He knew that he had done nothing for this substitutional death and last of all. Go along with this point. He knew that Jesus' death for him was all that was needed to save his life. Right. When Jesus was hanging on that cross. He said, it is finished. You can mark it down. It's not in the Bible, but you can mark it down. Whenever they came to Barabbas' cell and said, Barabbas, somebody else dies for you, you are set free. Barabbas wanted to know who was dying for him. Who was taking his place? Is this a joke? I'm going to have to find out, he might have said. I'm going to, I'm going to stay behind a tree or a building. I'm going to watch. And whenever that man does die, then I know that it is settled. He died for me, and that's all I need. Maybe he thought that they had taken him down from that cross as a cruel, cruel joke and didn't grab a hold of Barabbas and put him up on that cross, and he had died. But when Jesus died and he cried out, It is finished. Barabbas knew right then and there that it was finished, settled for him, that he would be going free, and that's all he needed is to know Jesus' death is enough. Amen. It is finished. And what in the world did Jesus mean, boys and girls, when he stood up, stood up on that cross, knelt to it, and he said, it is finished. Ladies and gentlemen, listen to me. When he said, it is finished, a lot of people said, that is not enough to be saved. We got to do some other things. It's not enough to believe in the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's not enough to believe by faith that Jesus will save you. If you call upon his name, he'll save you. It's not enough to take it by faith. It's not enough to believe in the burial, I mean, in the blood of Jesus Christ. I heard one man, ladies and gentlemen, I heard one man say on radio that the blood of Jesus Christ, blood has no more power than a chicken. I just shook my head and I said, that man don't know the power of Jesus Christ's blood. That man don't know the, the forgiveness and the cleansing that comes from Jesus Christ's blood. Amen? He don't know that. 
But he knew that Jesus' death for him was all that was needed for his, stand, for his life to be saved. Now, folks, listen to me. A lot of people, and perhaps here this morning, some of you are thinking, I have to do more than just come and ask Christ to forgive me my sins. I have to turn away from my sins. I'll use one verse of Scripture. For whosoever call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It did not say, Whosoever call the name of the Lord and turn away from your sins shall be saved. I have to give up this. Now, I do admit that you have to be willing in your heart to give up your sins. And I'll make a statement that if you say in your heart, I, I'm willing, I want to be saved, but I'm not willing to turn away from this sin, you cannot be saved. If you're not willing to turn away from your sins in your heart, you cannot be saved. You must be willing in your heart to ask Christ to forgive you of your sins and then he'll save you. But if you stubbornly rebel and say, well, I want to be saved, I want a ticket to go to heaven, but I'm not willing to turn away from my sin, you're wasting your time whenever you ask Christ down here to forgive you. For God knows what's in your heart, ladies and gentlemen. God knows if a man in his heart is convicted and broken of his sins, a man, God knows that, and, and you may fool yourself, and you may fool a preacher, and you may fool your mother and father, and you may fool a deacon, and you may fool a church, but you're that sure not going to fool God. God knows your heart. And if you're willing to come to him broken over your sins that you know that you sin against God, if you ask him for giving your sins, he said, I am no wise will cast out anyone. What about baptism, preacher? I never will understand why people that have some common sense that will just simply read the Bible, just simply read the New Testament and come away and say that it's Jesus and baptism saves you. There's no way in the world that you can do that. If you read the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and these Gospels, you'll find out that baptism is not what saves you and washes away your sins. You'll find that it's the blood of Jesus Christ that washes away the sins. Not water baptism. If water baptism washes away your sin, then why did Jesus die for? If turning away from your sins saved you, then why did Jesus die for you? Ladies and gentlemen, a lot of people think that Jesus' death is not enough, so we've got to be baptized. We've got to turn away from our sins. You know, Jesus wants you just as you are this morning. I'm, I came across a lot of people that they would say, Well, preacher, I, when I quit smoking, I will get saved. When I quit doing certain things, I will get saved. If you're that kind of a person this morning... Let me ask you a question. Do you want to be saved? And you say, yes, I want to be saved. Well, that's the battle right there. Then all you need to do is come and ask Christ to forgive you of your sins. Amen? That's all you need to do. Do the first step first and let God take care of the other step. Because I'm going to tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. After you get saved, this is going to be a shock to many, after you get saved, you're still going to sin. <laughs> I only got one amen on that. You mean you folks don't believe you're going to get, you, you don't sin? After you get saved, you sin. Amen. I'll say amen. I'll do my own amen if you don't do the amen. I mean, folks, we need to understand that Jesus Christ saves a man's soul. And this body we contend with all the time. And we will sin. Joining the church won't save you. Being baptized won't save you. Giving up your sin and saying, well, when I get, quit smoking and quit drinking and all that, then I'll get saved. Jesus wants you just the way you are. Well, this is going to be a hard one to swallow, to some. I'm going to, I must be filled with the Holy Spirit to be saved. No, you, no. To be saved, you got to be saved first, then you be filled with the Holy Spirit. A lot of people say, well, I've got to be filled with the Holy Spirit and speak in tongues, and then I know I'm saved. 
No. Barabbas knew that Jesus' death for him was all that it was needed to save his life. All you need to know is that Jesus died for you and your sinner and asked Jesus to save you of your sins, plus no, nothing else, plus not doing good works, plus not joining the church, plus not being baptized, not speaking in tongues, and all the rest of this. This does not save a soul. What saves a soul is Jesus Christ. Why in God's name can people understand that Jesus Christ saved it all? for all mankind. Some lady came up to me and said, well, what about my future sins? And I looked at her and I said, lady, you don't look like you're about 2,000 years old. And she looked at me kind of dumb and she said, well, no, I'm not 2,000 years old. And I said, lady, whenever Jesus Christ died for you, all of your sins were future. Jesus Christ died for all man's sins. And like I said earlier, you don't die and go to hell because of your sins. You die and go to hell because you reject Jesus Christ. Amen. You say, well, I got to do something. No, you don't have to do anything, anything except this. Realize you're a sinner and Jesus Christ paid for your sins and then ask him, forgive you of your sins and save you. I thought Baptist doctrine once you're saved, you're always saved. I hung on to that all my life, but I never did know Jesus. That doctrine is true, by the way. But I believed that because I was a Baptist, I was going to go to heaven. I was baptized in a Baptist church and, and, and when I was a little boy, and I, I said by that, I'm going to go to heaven. I'm a Baptist. I've been baptized. I'm going to go to heaven and live like a devil. I mean, I live like a devil. And as, as, as I was living like a devil, I was saying, I'm going to go to heaven. I'm going to go to heaven. I know I'm going to go to heaven. And me drunk, and we, I was sitting in a bar, and I say, oh, you guys are going to go to hell, and I'm going to go to heaven. And me drunk. And they said, Michael, if you go to heaven, the whole world's going to go to heaven. I said, no, you don't understand, fellas. I have been baptized in a Baptist church and a Baptist believes once you're saved, you're always saved. I'm a Baptist. I've been baptized, so I'm going to go to heaven. I'm going to uh, live it up down here, but I'm still going to go to heaven, and all you guys are going to go to hell because you, you've never been baptized. You're not a member of a Baptist church, so you're going to go to hell. I'm going to go to heaven, and, and I'm going to enjoy this life as I'm doing it, but I never met the Master. When I was 24 years of age, I realized I wasn't saved. My wife came forward during that service, and my brother came forward during that service, and they called me up. See, I was a member of that Baptist church. They called me up, and I had real long hair, and, I, and I'm not talking about the issue of long hair, but I had long hair, and I had cigarettes sticking out, and I smelled like a brewery because I was drinking when I came there that night, and they had me come up, and I was a member of that church. Can you imagine that? One of they didn't put me on the deacon board. <laughs> if I gave money, they probably would have. <laughs> but they called me up and stand beside my wife, and we shook hands. And all the time in my heart, I said, "Can't somebody show me that God will get? God can help me. Can somebody help me? I need help. I didn't know exactly what I needed, but I needed help. Somebody told me that God is good and God can help you. And I knew I wasn't saved." And so after the invitation, during the uh, after the invitation, everybody was leaving, and I was standing in the middle of the church sanctuary, and my mother hollered out and said, "Michael Earl Myers is showing your sister-in-law how to be saved." And I walked in the office, and three times I prayed, because I told him, I said, "Now Earl, you know I'm a member of this church, but you know I need to know if God's going to help me or not." He said, "Whosoever call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved." And he said, call in the name of the Lord. Pray right there. Linda, you pray. And so Linda prayed. That's my sister-in-law. She prayed. She got up. She said, uh, do you believe it? And he, she said, yeah, I got saved. He looked at me and said, Michael, did you ask Christ to forgive you of your sins and save you? I said, well, no, I asked him to help me. So I'm already a member of this church. I've already been baptized. 
And then I, I, he said, well, no, whosoever call the name of the Lord shall be saved. Nothing about baptism, nothing about joining a church, nothing be about a Baptist. But whosoever call the name of the Lord shall be saved. Kneel down again and ask Christ to forgive you of your sins. And I kneeled, raised up after he got done praying. He said, did you ask Christ to forgive you of your sins? And I said, no, I said, I'm already, I'm already a member of this church. Now help me with this. And he said, well, Michael, you kneel down this time and you forget about your membership and you just simply ask Christ to forgive you of your sins. Amen. And I fell down on my knees. Amen. And I said, oh, God, I don't understand all this. Oh, I know if I need you to help me. Would you, ask, I, would you save me and I ask him to forgive me of my sins and save me? I got up off of that my knees and he said, did you ask Christ to forgive you of your sins? I said, yeah. And he said, then you're saved according to the Word of God, are you not? Did you mean it? And I said, yes, and the Word of God meant it. And I said, good, I'm saved. I reached around over that, that big old desk, and I grabbed a hold of that guy. I pulled him up. He thought I was going to strangle him. My long hair got in his face and all that, and I was hugging him. And I said, thank you for showing me how to be saved and set me free. And he said, no, I didn't save you, nor did I set you free. Jesus Christ did. Amen. But you know, before I got out of that place, bear with me, I'm having fun. Might be the last time I'm up here. <laughs> but I, I went out of that place, and before I even got to my car, I wasn't excited. My, my feeling went away, it seems like. I went out and my wife was crying. She got saved that night. My brother got saved that night. He was crying, happy. And then my sister-in-law got saved and they was all crying and happy. And I came out and I said, I guess I'm not saved. I didn't get it because I don't feel like you got it. And I said, well, Tracy, you drive. I've got to read this scripture again. And I got, on the, got in the car and I was reading, going between Franklin and the middle of town on Route 73, I think it is. And I, I said, uh, whosoever called the name of the Lord shall be saved. And, I, and the Holy Spirit gave me that. He said it wasn't by feeling or baptism or works or anything. He just said, whosoever call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And I had a spell in the head. I started crying. I realized that God saved my soul. Jesus Christ saved this poor sinner. And he gave me a new name and a new heaven. And he wrote my name in heaven. And one day I'm going to go to heaven. Because of Jesus Christ died for me. You know, why preach Christ? Why preach Christ? In the book of Revelation chapter 20, and death and hell were cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death. Whosoever was not found written in the land's book of life was cast into the lake of fire. That's why I preach Christ. I preach Christ because I want each and every one of us and all the people that can hear my voice come to know Christ as, my, as their Savior, just like he was my Savior. Amen. If you're here this morning and you don't know Christ as your personal Savior, I'm going to ask that you come. Don't worry about if you can live it or not. If you just want to be saved, just one step at a time and ask Christ to forgive you of your sins. You're here this morning shackled by sin and you're confused and you don't know what to do. I say come to this altar and ask Christ to forgive you of your sins. And if you know of anybody, a loved one, a friend, a relative that needs to be saved, Christian, I'm going to ask that you ask Christ to save their soul. Let us all stand. Bow our heads.